extreme to the other. In, the, in that time period, the previous Rebbe would say a mimer every Tuesday, say a Hasidic discourse every Tuesday, which was a, 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 an anomaly because the previous Rebbe, because of his health, not many people were allowed to go into his room when he would uh, give a febring, and only on special occasions were there febrings that everyone was allowed to, were, were, were there febrings, and, and only very few people allowed to come. So that Tuesday, the, the saying the Hasidic discourse on Tuesday was something the Hasidim didn't want to miss. And Ray Edelman, he had no idea what a Hasidic discourse was, but within 72 hours of his arrival in 770, he realized like there's something special here. He wanted and he decided he's going to stay here and he became a real part of the yeshiva. So that was uh, the day after Shavuos, that Tuesday. Um, the Tuesday after Shavuos. Three months later, he had his first audience with the previous Rebbe between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and during the 10 days of Tshuva. And the previous Rebbe asked him when he, started, when he arrived in the yeshiva. And he answered, I arrived in the yeshiva three months ago. So the previous Rebbe asked him, did you oiskaland? Oiskaland literally means, did you learn something? What, what have you already learned? What did, what did you learn already? That's the Friedrich Rebbe asked him, what did you learn already? So he told the Friedrich Rebbe, he didn't really know what the word oiskaland was. He didn't, there's there's Vosas to learn, he knew, but oiskaland is different different nuance, and that word, he wasn't sure what that word meant. So the previous Rebbe said, he had, the Friedrich Rebbe explained his question. When I'm asking you what you learned, if you learned something, my question is, do you say Yehei Shmei Rabbah differently? What? Learning, being taught something means that you say, you say Yehei Shmei Rabbah. Oops, my, my thing, the camera, camera's not working. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Learning something, what does it mean? You learn something, what does it mean? You, you, you've, you've gained in, in knowledge. It means when you say Yehei Shmei Rabbah, it's done with a different kind of, uh, different, it's done differently, done, done a different kind of energy. The previous Shabbat spoke about other private matters, and uh, then he wished him a Gemar So in 1944, in the summertime, Rabbi Avram Hecht, who actually is Rabbi Zalmi Hecht's uh, Zayda, Rabbi Avram Hecht got married, and he, at that time, he was sent by the previous Rebbe to make a yeshiva in Baltimore. And because he had to go to the wedding, his own wedding, he needed someone to take over the yeshiva. So he asked Rabbi Edelman, Rabbi David Edelman, if he would be willing to, to accept the reins of the responsibility of the yeshiva. So he took care of the yeshiva for a couple of weeks, and apparently he was successful. And uh, when as soon as he came back from Baltimore, the previous Rebbe gave him his first mission. In those days, it was customary for all the students of the yeshiva to stay up all Thursday, the entire night on Thursday night. And then uh, on Friday morning, they would uh, run to the mikveh and daven early in the Friday morning. So he, as soon as he comes out of the mikveh on Friday morning, he meets the Rebbe secretary, the previous Rebbe secretary. And he says to him that the previous Rebbe wants to see you. He goes up to the second floor where the previous Rebbe's uh, room was, and the previous Rebbe said to him that he wants him to go to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and to make a yeshiva in Bridgeport. I, I just can't imagine like being in his shoes, like just to go to the city and make a yeshiva in the city. Anyways, he goes with another man named Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer Weiner, Lazar Weiner, and they stayed there for about a year. And the Rebbe would send them instruction very, very often. What they need to do, they would go to the post office every so often to see if any letters had come from the previous Rebbe. That's how often the letters would come. So they made the yeshiva in Bridgeport. And then at the end of the year, they got a letter from the previous Rebbe. And the previous Rebbe says, now he wants them, he wants Rabbi Edelman to go to Pittsburgh and to teach in the yeshiva in Pittsburgh. So after nine months of teaching, the previous Rebbe said that this mission was accomplished, and now he wants him to um, teach in yeshiva in Buffalo. In Buffalo, he joined my grandfather. My grandfather, Rabbi Fogelman, Olav Shalom, and him were together in Buffalo, and they were, ran the yeshiva in Buffalo for three years. In 1949, Tavshantes, the previous Rebbe sent him from there to Boston, stayed in Boston for a year, 
And then he told him to move to Springfield. And that's where he stayed his whole life in Springfield. It's just amazing that these Hasidim, you know, go here, go there. And they knew like wherever they're going, they're 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 in good hands because they know who's sending them. Like the previous Shabbat told my grandfather, Befogelman, wherever you go to spread Torah and Judaism, I am going with you. So they knew it didn't matter if it was Bridgeport, it was Boston, it was Pittsburgh, it was all the same. Anyway, so he was sent us to Springfield, and that's where he stayed in general. The Rebbe didn't um, tell anyone to leave the place the previous service sent them. Like my grandfather, for example, Rabbi Fogelman, he had this thought that it would be a good idea for him to move to uh, St. Louis. He had a good opportunity there, but the Rebbe really spoke to him very forcefully and clearly uh he had when he wasn't even planning to like ask Rebbe's advice, he was more like asking Rebbe's blessing. Rebbe said, How do you get such a wild idea? You have wild Yitzhahara to leave the place where you sent. How did this enter your mind? Anyways, but that's that's the that was the atmosphere they knew the Rebbe sent them. This is their mission, and, and they went with full faith and they were successful. So he got to Springfield. There was a chassid who lived there from the previous generation. His name was Rebbe Beryl Levin. He had arrived there from this little shtetl in Russia, in, in Europe, called Krenitz, in Russia. A lot of, a lot of very famous chassidim were from Krenitz. And whenever this Rabbi Bar 11 would visit 770, he was given a lot of respect. He was an older chassid. Besides that, he was also rich, and he was also very knowledgeable in Torah. He finished the entire Talmud several times. And in most chassidim of yesteryear knew the entire Tanakh by heart. And he also knew the whole Tanakh by heart. Like, well, of course. So he also was very careful about every word he said. He's a very, very unique individual. So one time he went to visit the previous Rebbe. And the Friedrich Rebbe said to him, Rebbe, the time has come to make a yeshiva in Springfield. Rebbe at that time, Rebbe at that time was 78 years old. And he didn't know what to answer. Like he's 78 years old. What does the previous Rebbe expect of him? So the Rebbe said, for Torah, Rebbe, for Torah, you have to have sacrifice. And that really transformed him. When he came back to Springfield, he got together all of the philanthropists in Springfield, and he, he got the funds together to found the yeshiva in Springfield. And when he was ready, uh, almost 80 years old, he took the responsibility of all, the, of all the finances of the yeshiva, and he went door to door, speaking to all the different people there, and he took the, this whole responsibility on, on, upon himself, and he said those were the best years of his life. He felt so alive, you know, being part of this, this holy mission. So the Rabbi, Rabbi Edelman was very often uh, getting instruction from the previous Rebbe throughout his mission there in Springfield, and uh, he, he's an interesting uh, ca- uh, story once is that he once was by, because of the previous Rebbe's uh, health condition, not everyone could understand the words of the previous Rebbe. And Rabbi Edelman said that he was able to understand, not everyone could. And one time he didn't understand what the previous Rebbe said. And what people would do is they would ask the Rebbe, our Rebbe, what the previous Rebbe had said. In general, the previous Rebbe's audiences took place in the Rebbe's room. Previous Rebbe's apartment was in the second floor of 770, but his private audiences happened in the Rebbe's room. And uh, after his audience with the uh, previous Rebbe, he went over to the Rebbe and he asked the Rebbe what, what, the, what the previous Rebbe had said to him. So the Rebbe said, I love to, uh, to, to ask my father-in-law about his audiences. So I love this opportunity. I'll go ask my father-in-law and I will tell you what my father-in-law said. So the first time that Rabbi Edelman met our Rebbe was the day the Rebbe arrived in America, which was the 28th of 7, 80 years, 80 years ago. Uh, the Rebbe arrived on a Tuesday. And when as soon as Rebbe arrived, the Hasidim asked the Rebbe to, to lead a Fabrengen. So the Rebbe said that now is Tuesday. On Thursday, he'll, he will get an Aliyah, he'll say a Goymel. And, and after he says a Bracham a Goymel, then the Rebbe will... Leader for bring. So Rosh Chodesh Tam was interesting. My grandfather was by that for bring, and that was the day he passed away uh, many years later. Rosh Chodesh Tam was the first day of Tam was uh, in 1941. The Rebbe led this for bring started at eight o'clock at night, exactly, and it went on till three o'clock in the morning. 
that was explaining at length the the uh, meaning of the Mishnah. There are four people who need to give thanks to Hashem, and one of them is someone who took who took a journey overseas. So at that, that, that time, they, they, all the Hasidim were able to recognize the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's greatness. The Rebbe spoke for seven hours about this mission. They could see that the Rebbe was, you know, who the Rebbe is. So Rabbi uh, Edelman said that he noticed that very often when he would seek the Rebbe's advice, there were, there were so many obvious miracles that happened things that he thought were like impossible situations, didn't know how to solve different things. But he spoke to the Rebbe and the Rebbe just would make with his hands and like, it's nothing. And immediately things changed. I'll tell you three stories of how about these, these different kinds of inc incidents that happened to him where things were like impossible. And they were like, I said, it's nothing, it's okay. And, and things just turned around. It sounds like what the... Uh, uh, in the in the after of Achan Shapesach, it speaks about Mashiach. Uvuruach piv yamas rash with the spirit of his lips, the evil are evil is destroyed. So in a similar way, there was said the words, and all of a sudden there was there was immediate change. It's it's stories which are incredible. But Rabbi Edelman, anyone who knew him, was a very down to earth person, and yet he says these stories happened. He was present, and I will share with you these stories. Number one, uh, in the fir his first time period in in Springfield. He wanted to buy a new building for the yeshiva, but he also needed to afford money for the down payment. To afford money for the down payment, he wanted to sell the old building, but he couldn't find anybody who wanted the old building. There was a lot of different issues in the old building. No one wanted to buy it. So he came into the yichidus, came to the Rebbe's room, private audience, and he told the Rebbe, I cannot sell the old building. The Rebbe said, everything will be okay. Nothing to worry about. But he repeats the Rebbe, again, it's so difficult. No one wants to buy the old building. I have no money to, um, to, uh, to pay the down payment. I forgot to tell you that he was supposed to give the money for the down payment. And he asked the Rebbe, what should he do? He doesn't have the money. The Rebbe said, tell the guy to wait. So the guy waited. But now he still doesn't have the money. And, and he comes back to the Rebbe. I canceled the old building. I don't have the money for the down payment. What should I do? The Rebbe says to him, don't worry. A second time, everything will be okay. He comes back to Springfield. His audience was with our Rebbe was at three o'clock in the morning. And he arrives back in Springfield at eight o'clock in the morning. And he, he, he goes straight to the yeshiva. He's about to go in. And this woman is standing at the entrance of the door of the building. And she's holding a, a, a sack of cash and folded up dollars in her, in her, in her little sack. And she says to him, is it true that you want to sell your building? He said, yes. So she says, okay, I'll buy it. He said, do you want to look at it first? She says, no, no, I'll, I'll buy it. He says, there's a lot of issues in this building. She said, it's okay. I don't need to see it. I want to buy it. I, I, like, I like this neighborhood, this development in, in, in um, people, the Jewish institutions being built in this neighborhood. So I like this. I like this and I want to buy this building. My husband's very rich. He says, but things have to be fixed here. He says, don't worry, my father-in-law is rich. She'll take care of whatever has to be fixed. So in, 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 in a second, that's, that's, that, she gave him the cash for the building, cash. And uh, with that, he didn't have to worry anymore about how to find the money for the down payment, the new building. There was um, an issue he had. When he, brought, he bought a, a beautiful um, whole uh, field to be used for the yeshiva. I'm not sure if the same field that I merited to uh, play uh, softball in. Our, our, we had a we always had a uh, duel or a, we had a game between the the the, who, the softball team of Worcester, Massachusetts against the softball team of Springfield, Massachusetts. We had our annual game. I don't know if the game took place in this field or not, but he wanted to um, build in this field, and he couldn't get a permit. He could not get a permit for doing any construction. And because the city was saying he has to put a new pipe there for water, he has to, do, he has to and he couldn't figure out a way to, that the city would be satisfied so he could put the pipe in and, and build there. So he comes to the Rebbe, he tells them the issue, and again, the Rebbe says to him, don't worry, everything will be okay. He goes back to Springfield. The next morning, he goes to that, that field that he had purchased, and the city is not letting him get permits. He goes to that field, and on the field, he sees a man named 
Mr. Mr. Gluck. Mr. Gluck says to him, hi, I'm Mr. Gluck. I'm in the city has appointed me to um, to uh, to to uh, basically be the person that issues the uh, permits. And I decided I'm going to get you permits to build your building. And he says, I see that your students are God fearing people. I think that they're the future of 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 Jews in America. And therefore, I decided I'm going to arrange for you to get these permits. Mamish, like that. Rabbi Edelman says, doesn't sound like something that makes any sense, but he says, I saw this with my eyes. That's how we were able to build our building. At another occasion, he came to the Rebbe in an audience, told the Rebbe that he has a problem with the budget. He feels the budget is just beyond their means. And uh, he doesn't know what to do about this. Uh, about this. The Rebbe still told him, that uh, the growth of the budget is a normal thing. So it's a normal thing that the budget grows and uh, not, not to worry about it. Uh, a week later, a woman comes with her brother and they were, their mother just passed away. She would always give the yeshiva $25. And she, their, mother, their mother just passed away and they put on the table $20,000. And they asked to dedicate a room in the yeshiva in memory of their mother. And then a few days later, another woman who would never give the yeshiva any money at all, all of a sudden decided that she wants to give a significant sum to support the yeshiva. And that's how their issue with the budget just disappeared. Two more stories as you guys go. Uh, one time, they, they would have this custom, the Edelman family, to go to the Rebbe for a private audience once a year. In one of these audiences, in the middle of the winter, his two-year-old had a cold. And his wife, Mrs. Edelman, decided to leave the two-year-old home. So they came to the Rebbe with their five older sons, their two younger daughters. And he gives the Rebbe a long list of things. He's doing this, he's doing that. He comes to his room, he gives the Rebbe the list. The Rebbe puts down the, uh, the Rebbe looks at the paper, the Rebbe looks around and says, where's your, where's your daughter? And... Um, They, they, at one point, they had an opportunity to move to a uh, new, new, upper, new, new um, position, a different city. And he was considering moving to a different position. And he asked, his wife said, we should have moved this position. The conditions are there will be a lot better, a lot easier. Perhaps we should move somewhere else. So he told his wife, well, we could ask the Rebbe this question. We come to that yearly audience we have with our family. We'll come in, we'll ask the Rebbe. So she said, okay. They come into the Rebbe's room. She tells the Rebbe, the Rebbe that why she wants to move. The Rebbe said there, have you ever thought about the fact that in the new place you're going to go, you're going to have to be under someone else's, you're going to be working for somebody. And maybe you won't get along with them. But in Springfield, the only person that you're under is Hashem. So they stayed. They once were having a very great difficulty in their finances. And the Rebbe said to Rabbi Edelman, in heaven, there is no good that is missing. God is not missing any good in heaven. You only have to make the appropriate vessels to receive the blessing. And the appropriate vessels are the, are the Torah classes that you teach in public. And they that's how you receive the blessings. Then there will continue. I suggest that you give a, a class in the shul called Kesser Israel. Kesser Israel. Give it a shir in that in that, that um, synagogue. And I suggest you get the shirt in Mincha and Meir. Because before Mincha, so people aren't there yet. And after Meir, people leave to go home. So I suggest you give a class between Mincha and Meir in this synagogue. Rabbi like Edelman's thinking to himself, like, it's impossible because the, the, the show is very lit for show, and he's going to share Hasidus there. It's not going to fit. And as he's thinking, this repeats again. I suggest you give a shear in the in the shul Kasser Israel. And it should be between Mincha and Meir. Because before Mincha, not everyone's there. And after Meir, people are already going home. After I repeat this twice, you already knew that this is going to happen. Rebbe said it. The Ruach Piv. So he comes there, and lo and behold, he told the rabbi he wants to give a shear in, in between Mincha and Meir. The rabbi agrees immediately, which was a total shock to him. The rabbi was from total different uh, background they're not really someone who thought would appreciate Hasidus and stuff but he immediately agreed 
and he started getting shiurim. And as the Rebbe said, in heaven, nothing is no, nothing is missing in heaven. Only to do is make the is make the vessels, and the vessel is to teach Torah in public. So he started teaching Torah in public, and the blessings came down. L'chaim, l'chaim. Those are the stories I wanted to share. For each of us and all of us. And the Shasim Kar Mamish Mashiach Sakainu. Thank you, Rabbi. Heaven is good stuff already. You just need to make the vessels. Machaim. Machaim. Turn it off. No, come